and welcome to the RCM online experience. On behalf of Pastor Mike and First Lady Angela McClure Sr., we would like to welcome you to join us on this worship experience this morning. While you're at it, go ahead and like, tag, and share this video. And don't forget that hearts are our new hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining in with us because here at RCM, it can't be described, only experience.
say our church today? Somebody give God a great big hand clap of praise. Come on. <laughs> oh, my God. In here, mighty God. In here, mighty God. Let me ask y'all a question. What a mighty God we serve. <laughs> Boy, friend, I heard somebody say angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. My question is, what a mighty God we serve. I'm excited. I'm simply delighted to be before you again this morning. I am Mike McClure Sr., everybody's favorite pastor. And I'm so happy to be here this morning to share with you from the Word of God. I tell you what, everything's going down except the Word of God. How many of y'all believe that? Accept the word of God. Let me call your attention, if I would, to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. 2 Samuel 5, 11 and 12. When you have it, you're going to find these words. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people, Israel's sake. I want to I I accentuate verse 12 one more time. And David perceived that the Lord had made him king. And David perceived that the Lord had made him king. If you would, just for a few minutes, I want to talk about I know now. I want to talk about I know now. There's a lot of things in life, I must be honest. I messed up. <laughs> I, I need to go on and be honest with y'all. I've made some crazy decisions. I gotta be honest, I've gone in the wrong directions more than once or twice. I promise y'all, I've messed up a lot of money, I've lost a lot of friends, I just didn't know any better. Have, have you ever said to yourself, boy, if I knew then what I know now, I never would have made that stupid decision. If I knew then <laughs> what I know now, oh, my God, I never would have did that silly move. And there's some folk out there, you got your church face on, you smil smiling now. But truth of the matter is, and look straight ahead so the person you're sitting next to won't know you're talking about them. Because <laughs> truth of the matter is, if you knew then what you know now, you never would have married that person. <laughs> I wish I had some help. Someone once said that hindsight is always 20-20. I, I beg the difference. I, I know some old heads who are still making such the same mistakes, saying the wrong stuff, and they still hanging out in the same old raggedy, uh, hole-in-the-wall, wrong places. Yeah, I asked myself why. I finally figured it out, and now it's plain as day to me. They have an unhealthy, unrealistic, unwanted view of themselves. They don't see themselves in a healthy way. They don't have a heavenly perspective of who they are. They cannot see what God has planned for their lives. You cannot convince me this morning that a man who continuously brings danger and detriment to his own life and puts his own soul in jeopardy, understands who God is. They see themselves through the lens of negativity. They see themselves through the lens of doubt, disappointments. They see themselves through the lens of abandonment and abuse. They see themselves through the lens of betrayal, indebtedness. They're clothed and clothed and covered in self-pity. They, they walk around in a state of discouragement. They have no proper view of themselves. They no longer have any idea as to who they really are. First Corinthians, Paul made a statement, 13, 12. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know a little bit. Now we don't have all the answers. Now we know in part. It says, but then shall I know, even as I am known. And because these people are walking around uh, uh, and see themselves in this dark, dreadful, doomed, dead manner, every move they make, 
Every move they make is tainted. It's tied to the way they see themselves. Everything they do, they fly too low because they don't see themselves soaring as eagles. They see themselves crawling on the ground as chickens. They, they cannot understand that greater is he that is within them than he that's in the world. They don't get that God has great exploits in store for them. They don't understand that God has created them to be mountain climbers, mountain movers. That God has uh, created them to be uh, uh, giant killers. They can't see themselves in that way. Simply put, they lack an element of faith. I choose to call perspective. And I need you to look at somebody and tell them faith is perspective. Faith is, per somebody say faith is perspective. Faith, faith is a way of considering things. Faith is a way of looking at things. Faith is a way of understanding things. Your perspective is the way you see or view life. Some of us can't make it simply because we don't look through the lens of faith. So when trouble come, we don't see ourselves conquering the trouble. Lack of faith, we see ourselves being beat down by the trouble. Somebody in this morning on my live right there, I'm looking at you in Facebook land. I'm looking at you on YouTube. I'm looking at you all over the world. Listen to Mike McClure, your favorite pastor. And I'm telling you this morning, your biggest issues aren't the things you're going through. But the way you consider what you're going through, the way you perceive what you're going through, you don't understand that God is doing a work in you. You don't understand that in the end you're going to win. But because your eyes have grown dim, you're having a pity party. Faith is a perspective. That word perspective has a Latin root meaning. It means to look through or to perceive. It means to look through or perceive. It means to get a deeper understanding than surface notions. It means to understand that God is always working the greater in you. Somebody need to understand that by faith all things work together for the good of those that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Many times we do not see the right things because we do not say the right things. Now, watch this. This is going to be dope, Derricka. If you change the way you talk to you about you, because the story you tell yourself about yourself determines the way you see yourself. I said the story you tell yourself about yourself will determine how you see yourself. You can only see yourself according to the last way you talked about yourself. If you are viewed by yourself according to your last conversation, what do you look like? What kind of things are you saying about yourself? Watch this. Change the way you talk to you about you. Change the way you talk to you about you because the story you tell yourself about yourself determines the way you see yourself. And the way you see yourself drives the way you walk in life. Some of you guys will never, ever amount to much because you never talk about much. Oh, my God, when you change your environment, you will change your requirements. I need somebody right now to change the conversation about yourself. Watch this. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, it tells us that a man, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, you become what you think about the most. You become the thoughts that you incubate in your mind, in your mental state. Whatever you see about you, that's what you become. Watch this. Roman says, it tells a man, think in his heart, so is he. Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, he concluded that we become what we think about. We become what we think about. Job said, my greatest fears the things that I thought the most about, the things that I thought the worst about, they have come upon me. But I like this thing. I need to tell somebody, I want to reprogram the way you talk. Joel 3, 9, 10 says, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Check it out. He says, prepare war. He says, wake up the mighty man. He says, let all the men of war draw near. He says, let them Come up. 
He says, beat your plowshares in the swords and your pruning hooks in the spears. Wait a minute. Look back over what he says. Number one, he says, prepare. Number two, he says, wake up. Number three, he said, come close, draw near. Number four, he says, come up and beat. But then when you do all of that, the final thing is after you've done all these steps, there's one final step you must make. He said, let the weak say, I am strong. I need some folk out here today. Don't wait till you get strong. Start calling yourself strong right now while you're feeling beat down. Right now when you're feeling like you can't conquer it. Right now when you're feeling like all hope is gone. Everything is over. I need some folk to stand up right now. Start beating yourself in the chest like you're Tarzan. I wish I had some help here. And say, I am strong. I am strong. I need you to tell you, COVID can't beat you. I wish I had somebody. Politics can't wipe you out. You are not depressed. You are not oppressed. You are not suppressed. I am strong. I need somebody. Say, I am with God. I am strong. I'm strong. I am strong. Nothing but bad news coming my way, but I can handle it because I'm strong. Friends are walking out on me. I'm getting lonely, but I'm strong. Ah, I've been furloughed from my job, but I'm strong. In these holiday seasons, it's been prophesied been said over and over again, this is going to be one of the darkest holiday seasons in history. So I want to tell you, before you even get into this season, I need you to start saying, I am strong. Watch this, watch this. I love the prescription. He says, let the weak say. Let the weak say. In other words, you got to start talking about yourself, not how you feel, but how you perceive what God is doing. I'm not strong because I think I am. I'm strong because I say I am. And the Bible says I can have whatever I say about myself. The difference between the happy you and the unhappy you is your perspective of you and what you say about you. I don't know about other folks' conversations about Mike McClure, but I don't know what my conversation is. And my conversation is I am what God says I am. I can have what God says I can have. I can do what God called me to do. My conversation is greater. Is he that is within me? My conversation is I'm the head and not the tail. I'm lender and not borrower. I'm above, above and not beneath. I'm blessed coming and going, sitting and uprising. I, my conversation is I am the crowning jewel of all creation. My conversation is I am with the apple of God's eye. I'm the answer to every question. I'm the solution to every problem. I'm a daughter to every closed way. I am a way. I am what God called me to be. Now, what do you say about you? So amazing. I'm reminded when I was in elementary school, the power of elementary school, I never shall forget. I can't remember the teacher. I think it was Miss McLemore. I forgot what teacher it was, but I remember in her class, we all had to write a paper on somebody. We had to write a paper on, on, you know how you write a paper on a black history leader or, or some military leader, something like that. We had to write one of those papers, and different ones came in, and one brother came in. Uh, his parents had him in a black suit, a white shirt, and a black tie. And he stood up, and he said, I am Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Another, another one came in, and you, uh, you all, you remember that commercial? One boy came in, he said, I am Malcolm X. <laughs> different, one, different ones came in, and different ones said they were different people, and my turn came. My turn, came, my turn came, and y'all need to watch this. This is a true story. And there I come in. I got on regular jeans. I got some old dusty regular tennis shoes, old regular shirt. Every day, everybody looking at me like, who he is? And I stood in front of the class, and I began to talk. I did it different. Most folk gave their name first, then told their story. I came up dressed as I was, and I told my story first. I gave my story that I didn't come from much. I gave my story that my coffers were not running over with money. I gave my story that I had been coming, I had been raised in the projects. I gave my story of my father and my mother being very wonderful, loving parents, that I had five siblings. I gave my story. After I gave my story, I closed with, if you're wondering who I am, I'm Mike McClure. 
I mean, this is not a made-up story. And I don't know what grade I was in, but even then, my class started clapping. My class started clapping because I was determined that my circumstances did not dictate my destiny. I, I wish I had somebody to understand. See, what you don't understand, your destiny is, is, is determined through your identity. Until you can discover who you are, you cannot go where you've been called to come. I wish I had some help here. Until you discover who you are, you can never be what God called you to be or do what God has called you to do. The difference between the blessed you and the unblessed you is your identity, is your perspective of who you are. Can I tell somebody that's what's happening in your life? Right now, it's not your problem. What's happening in you is not your problem. Can I tell somebody, what's happening to you is not your problem. That's not your problem. Your problem is not what's happening in you. Your problem is not what's happening around you. Your problem is not what's happening to you. No, no. The problem is your perspective. Or in other words, your problem is what you are saying about you. What are you saying about you? I wake up every day and tell myself today it's going to be a great day. I wake up every day to reminding myself that today will be a prosperous day. I think I'm in about my 20th year of saying to myself, I have money that I know not of. Who said it? I heard somebody else say it just then. I've been saying it for 20 years. I've been saying it for 20 years. I have a T-shirt that I had made almost 15 years ago. And it says, I am a money magnet. I was saying this when I was barely making rent. I was saying this when I was considering bankruptcy. I have money that I have not of. I was saying this when I was unemployed. I was saying this when I was renting other, car, other folks' houses. I was saying this when I had to borrow other men's cars. I was saying this when I was living on other folks' credit. And had they pulled their credit, I would have lost my breath because I couldn't afford to buy air. But I was still saying, I have money that you know not of. I was still talking prosperity. I was still believing in my heart that God had greater for me. I believed it. I knew it then. But let's look at David in our text today. He's been anointed to be king for a long time now. Yet it's not until the actions of other people in his surrounding that causes him to see himself as he really is. God been anointed David king. But up to now, David could not perceive who he was. I wonder, how many of you out there right now, you're mighty, you're powerful, but you can't see it. Everybody can see greater in you except you. Everybody can see that you are gifted but you. Everybody can see that you are explosive but you. Everybody else recognizes it and you hadn't seen it yet. Sometimes, we just ought to thank God for the people in our lives that helps us find us. Sometimes we ought to just thank God for those teachers in our lives, those preachers in our lives, those mentors, those coaches, those parents, those leaders that God sent by in sundry times to help us discover who we really are. Can I tell y'all something real quick? Can I tell you, Ann, that there are three vital hard qualities that God wants to create inside of all of us that we might discover who we really are? Can I say that, number one, God wants all of us to have the quality of humility? Somebody say humility. Humility. When I talk about humility, I'm really talking about vertical control. Vertical control. When I talk about vertical control, I'm talking about understanding who I am with God and understanding who I am without God. Because, see, I need to say to somebody, you will never have any degree of humility until you come to the realization that with God, I can do all things 
But without God, I am nothing. I need some folk to get with me right now and understand, do you know who you are with God versus who you are without God? Without God, without God, I am nothing. And without God, I can do nothing. Without God, I would fail. Without God in my life, I don't understand how I can make a decision. I don't understand how I can face tomorrow. Without God in my life, I don't don't understand breathing. I don't understand hearing. I don't understand seeing. Without God in my life. Is there anybody up in here right now know that without God in your life that you wouldn't make it? Is there anybody here ever tried to go without God? Can you remember how dead your life was? How I wish I had them helping here. Without God. Humility. Vertical control. I know who I am with God. With God, I can do all things. With God, I'm invincible. But without God, secondly, God wants all of us. I don't have humility. He wants us to have dependence. Whereas humility, uh, humility uh, uh, really to me works with vertical control. And I'll see if y'all can catch this. I believe dependence is talking about depth control. I believe dependence, talking about how deep you are. Dependence, 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 dependence. Because some of us aren't as deep as we think we are. And we don't understand that if we don't have God, we ain't got nothing. Some of us, some of us right now think we're deep, but we don't have God. We don't depend on God. We depend on our education. We're dependent upon our pedigree. pedigree. We're dependent upon our income. But depth control is understanding my, limitation, my limitations while recognizing who I am in God. See, I need to talk to somebody. Watch this. I know my limitations, sir. I know my limitations. I know, I know that, man, be careful. Don't, don't, hey, don't take Mike off. Am I by myself? No, no, don't, 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 don't try Mike. Try Jesus. I throw hands. I, I wish I had some help. No, 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 don't watch. No, 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 don't. But, 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 I have depth control. I have depth control. I understand and I recognize who I am in God. Brother, can I tell you? In God, you are mighty. In God, you are powerful. See, can I tell you that in God, you are the answer? Can I tell somebody out there right now that, in, that, that you were created to solve problems? <laughs> can you mean that? You were created to solve problems? Did, did, did you know that right now your anointing is more about other folks than it is about you? Depth control, dependence. Number one, God wants to have humility, vertical control. He wants to have dependence, depth control. But then God wants to have a degree of gratitude. Because, because gratitude is horizontal control. In other words, always knowing that God is responsible for the blessings that are in your life. I stay on top of that thing. I understand that ain't nothing I've done in life was about me. Where I am today, I didn't do it. I didn't do it today. What I have has nothing to do with the job I work. Have nothing to do with my savings account. They have nothing to do with my investments. It's all because God decided to bless me. It's all, it's all because God decided that I was worried of being blessed. God made this way for me. And until we have humility, dependence, and gratitude, we can never really fully be all that God has called us to be. If you're taking the credit, let me say this to somebody and see if this could bless you, my man. Every time you make a blessing, you miss one. And the blessing you miss is always greater than the blessing you made. Fred, did that make sense? Can I say that? Every time you make a blessing, you miss a blessing. And the blessing you miss is always greater than the blessing you made. I want to ask somebody this morning, what would it take for you to sell out and let go and let God have his way in your life? Without these qualities, humility, dependence, and gratitude in our lives, we lose balance. And our lives begin to spin out of control. 
In other words, in other words, I need to tell somebody, life does not work well without these qualities. Life, life, life does not work well without them. Life, life, life does not do what it should do. It don't go where it should go. It don't feel like it should feel without these qualities. Well, the text says in 2 Samuel 5, 11, and Hiram, king of Tyree, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built a house. And David perceived that the Lord had made him king. Your identity is the key to your destiny. Until you discover who you are, you can never reach your full potential. Until you discover who you are. Who am I talking to out there right now? I feel right now I'm really ministering to somebody now. You're wrestling between two opinions. You're trying to discover what it is God has called you to do. But can I ask you to take a hiatus just for a moment? Before you really move forward in your plans, can you take the rest of this week and fast and pray before God and simply ask God to help you discover who you are? Because you're going to discover that it's going to be your identity. God blesses you according to who he created you to be. And when you're acting like everybody except who God created you to be, you lose out on the blessings that God has for the person he created. Because God is not in the business of building facades. God, God is not in the build business of building folk that lives a fake life. Oh, my God. God is not in the business of setting up your probabilities. God, God is not in the building of, uh, 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 in the business of blessings your maybes. God wants you to prosper in the person that he created you to be. Now, let me give you some context. Following Saul's death, David is now anointed king of Judah. Judah is the southern portion, come on here, of the promised land. One of Saul's sons by the name of Ishbosheth, he also was known as Ishbaal. He survived his father and his brothers. Abner, who had been Saul's general, made Ibosheth king of Israel, which was the northern portion. So right now, the promise is divided. I want to talk to some folk right now who are experiencing a divided promise. God made your promise. You got half of it, but right now the other half is under somebody else's authority. I want to tell you, submit yourself to the hand of God and watch God work things. Is somebody out there right now. You only got a piece of what God promised you. You ain't got to fight for it. You ain't got to cuss nobody out. You ain't got to try to take it. Just stand still and see God's salvation. There's some things going on underlining. On, I wish I had me some. Somebody. God never makes a promise he can't keep. You got a king over the southern part. Jesus. You got a king over the northern part. Abner, who was Saul's general, he made Ishbosheth king of Israel. That's the northern part of the promise. David is king of Judah. That's the southern part of the promise. Following all that, there was a battle between Israel, led by Abner, and Judah, led by Joab. I wonder, have you ever felt in your life that the thing God has promised you is fighting against itself? You ever been there in your life? God promised you stuff, and it looked like every time you make one step forward, you get knocked two steps backwards. Look at this thing. It's fighting against itself. But wait a minute. Watch this. In this battle, Judah loses. Judah loses 20 soldiers. Judah loses 20 soldiers. Judah, the tribe of Judah, stands for the praisers. Your praising lost out. But it lost 20 soldiers. But watch this. Watch this. Israel lost 360 soldiers. Just before you think that what you lost while you were praising God was too much for you to bear, take another look. 
I guarantee that no matter what you lost in praise, everybody that was coming against you lost a whole lot more than you did. I want to tell some folk in this season, I don't care what you lost. If you would stay in your position of praise, stay in your worship, stay in praise, stay in your worship. Let the praises of God continually be in your mouth. Every chance you get a chance to praise him, take advantage of it. When you get bad news, before you drop your head and doubt, lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory, he will come in. I want to give somebody about 30 seconds right here. I want you to just throw your head back. I want you to throw your hands up and begin to bless God because he's God. Begin to bless God because he promised you. Begin to bless God simply because he woke you up, started you on your way. I know you lost some stuff, but bless God for what still remains. I need some folks who bless God because although you lost your house, Lord God, you still got a roof over your head. I don't care if you had a Motel 8. I don't care if you where they left the light on for you. If you got a roof over your head, I need you to get and bless God right now because whether you know it or not, if I could get you to change your perception, if I could get you to stop worrying about what you lost and start blessing God for what you about to gain because somebody right now, the rest of your promise is on the way. I'm about to get excited right here. The rest of your promise is on the way. There's a battle raging beneath the scene, and God is working things out. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Accused by Ibishel or going into Saul's concubine. Abner defected to David and persuaded the elders of Israel to favor David over Ishbosheth. So let me tell y'all something. You ever want to see two enemies get together, give them a common enemy. But here's the problem. They will come together to kill you. But in their attempt to kill you, they will always destroy themselves. Stop fighting against folk for the will of God. Stop fighting against folk for your blessings. Stop fighting against people for your promises. If God said it, that settles it. If God has said you were going to have a thing, there is no power on earth that can stop you from having what God said you would have. God has a way of working things beneath the scene. Watch then. It says, but then Joab, he kills Abner, Jesus, to avenge the death of his brother. Now watch this. There are two boys by the name of Rechab. Y'all catching this? Rechab and Benah, thinking they would incur David's favor, they go kill Ishbosheth. Wait a minute. David ain't made a fist yet. But all his enemies are killing each other. Can I tell somebody that right about now if you would trust God and bless God, you're about to enter into a season that everything that's been working against you, you're going to discover that it's been working on your behalf all along. You're going to begin to change your perspective. Can I tell somebody right about now God is working things out. I dare you to jump up on your feet. I dare you to begin to praise God. Oh! All things are working together for the good of those that love God, who are the called. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. David responded by having recap and Benah killed and their bodies mutilated. They thought they would win his favor. They didn't understand. See, the death now, now that Ibosheth, are y'all catching this? Now that he's dead, it left a power vacuum or a leadership vacuum in the leadership, oh God, of, of Israel. When he died, he left an opening for king. David is sitting on half of the promise. 
Now, everything that was working against him worked against itself and ended up working out for him. Now, they're looking for somebody who could fill the void. I'm going to tell somebody right here, right now, in Jesus' name. Hope you ain't scared of a little prophecy. But I want to tell somebody, in the next seven days, you better get ready. I want to tell somebody whose telephone hadn't rang. I want to talk to somebody whose mailbox hadn't clicked. I want to tell some folk right now, in the name of Jesus, if you can receive this right here, I know nobody's been knocking down your door trying to find you, but what you didn't understand was the war was taking place under current. You didn't see it. You saw the duck on the water, and he wasn't moving. But what you didn't know beneath the flood, his little feet were pedaling it. Oh, I wish I had some help. And although nothing been moving above ground, God been working underneath the surface. God been moving folk out. Uh, uh, so you better uh, by Sunday. Stop crying about the folk that are walking out of your life. Stop crying about the folk that have turned their back on you. Stop crying about the folk who ain't trying to help you. I wish, I wish, I wish I could tell somebody God already got your replacement. Just because your team changed doesn't mean your dream has to. The dream will still come to pass. The dream will still win. The death of Ishbosheth left a power vacuum. It left a leadership vacuum. That led the elders of Israel to come to David, seeking to persuade him to assume their throne as well as the throne of Judah. They're coming to David. They wanted an established kingdom. Verse 11 says, then I want to tell somebody, time ain't just being wasted, but something's going on on your behalf. I want to tell somebody, I don't know if y'all getting this. I need y'all to understand, you ain't got to do nothing about it. You don't have to fight for what God has for you. The thing that God has for you. See, you remember when he said, wait on the Lord? That word wait don't mean be still and cross your arms or cross your legs. That word wait means work. So how do we work on fulfilling God's promises? We serve God. We worship God. We praise God. I need some folk who are not afraid to get busy worshiping God while you don't have it. I need some folk who will praise God when it doesn't look like things are going to work out in your favor. I'm trying to tell you that God is working things out. And verse 12 says, then Hiram, I mean 11, king of Syria, he sent messengers to David. With cedar trees and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a house for David. It was now in verse 12 that David realized that the Lord had established him as king. He'd been king, but it wasn't until somebody else bust the move out of the ordinary because this king Hiram. He had two choices. He could have embraced David as king and ally, uh, or he could have done uh, 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 as, as, as Goliath's folk did. He could have resisted and attacked David as his enemy. He had only two choices, but watch this. Hiram chose to embrace David as a friend. That tells me something. And you all need to catch this, Derek. Mr. David not only learned the effects of war, but he also discovered the art of winning. And some of you guys, watch this, some of y'all know how to fight. You just don't know how to win. Because after you come out of a fight, everything else ought to work in your favor. But if you coming out of a fight and still fighting what you fought, it's because you didn't understand the purpose of you being in the fight in the first place. You ought to be fighting to win them. You ought to be fighting to change situations. You ought to be fighting to conquer those things that are working against your purpose, not your personality. You ought to be fighting against those things that are hindering God's will, not just your way. You ought to be making up in your mind, I'm fighting because I want my life to please God. I got to go. What if I tell you this morning that sometimes your gifts can take you where your character 
can't keep you. David had the gift of war, but he also understood. Watch this, Angela. Lee, David not only had the gift of warring, but he had the character to keep him once he won. Because some of us, let me say this, what if I tell y'all that sometimes the seeds to our future troubles are sown in the times of great success and prosperity. Some of us get in more trouble in peace than we ever will in war. Why? Because oftentimes we handle trials better than triumphs. Why do we handle trials better than triumphs? Because it was your trials that kept you focused. But your triumph brought you freedom. Then you allow your freedom or your, to tear down your character. Your character pulled you out the will of God. And what, it, what takes a lifetime to build through competence can be struck, destroyed in an instant through bad character. Sometimes your competence can help you win, but your character will help you lose what you want. They, David knew how to hold on to what he won in battle. Galatians 5 says, 13, you, my brothers, were called to be free. Only don't let your freedom, uh, don't let your freedom cause you to indulge. It's some folk right now. God has been better than you than you ever been in yourself. This is one of the greatest seasons in your life. You're in the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. The problem is your character is getting out of whack. And your character is about you to do things that you ordinarily would not do. So what was it that David discovered? Maestro, give me a little something. What was it that David discovered that brought him to the place where he discovered who he really was? What was it that when King Hiram of Tyre, when he sent the messages to David, when he sent the carpenters and the masons and everything he needed, and they built David this home, this mansion, castle. What was it about that that caused David to discover something? And what was it that David discovered? I'll tell you. Number one, in my closing, David discovered in verse 12a, that it was God who made him. I want to talk to some folk out there right now. If you're waiting on anybody else, if you're waiting on your break, you waiting on your setup, you waiting on somebody to give you a discount, you, you waiting on somebody else to open doors for you, can I tell you, until you discover that only the Lord can put you in the place that he has designed for you, you cannot keep anywhere else you stand. Everywhere else is nothing but sinking sand. You need to discover that, that with God, all things are possible. I need you to discover that with God on my side, who can stand against me? I need you to discover that when I have the Lord, he's more for me than the whole world is against me. I need you to understand that God has already made a way. God, God has already seen fit to go into your future and settle everything that would work against you. I need you to acknowledge God in all your ways and lean not to your own understanding. I need you to say with me, God made me. I often wonder, why is it in times of my life when I needed folk the most, God wouldn't send nobody in my life to help me. And I discovered what it was. Erica, God did not want any man's fingerprints on his blueprints. God wanted me to look back at it and realize that in every time of trouble, it was God that kept me. It was God that opened doors for me. First thing David discovered is that it was the Lord that made him. The Bible says when David beheld all that was done, he perceived, he looked through the building. He looked through the gifts. He looked, he looked through what folk were saying and he perceived this gotta be God. No other reason. These guys should be fighting me, but they're working for me. This gotta be God. Can somebody just for a moment take an inventory of the blessings in your life? Can you tell me right now who did all this in your life? Until you get there, I heard you say, God, until you get to the place in that nobody but Jesus, nobody else. 
I love, I love the song that says, silver and gold, silver and gold, and all them other words. But then it says, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. Stick your chest out and say, God made me. Stick your chest out and say, God. And I love another one. You know, what NIV says, the ESV version says, God established him as king. See, what God puts up, no one can pull down. He was not just made. He was established. David wasn't looking for this. It started while he was out keeping his father's sheep, the first anointing. Now, and whether you know it or not, studying the historicity of the Bible, we'll discover that this is the third time David will be anointed for the same position. Because sometimes God has to remind you what he's done in you. Sometimes sometime God has to come back and remind you that I didn't make a mistake when I chose you. Number one, he discovered that the Lord made him. Second thing he discovered is that the kingdom that God gave him didn't belong to him, but it belonged to God. Oh, everything I am and everything I'm not, everything I have, it belongs to God. This ain't mine. Watch this. The Bible says the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth hath he given to the sons of men. Wait a minute. He didn't give it to you to own. He gave it to you to run. He, he gave it to you to steward, to oversee it, to ensure that it produces what God's desire. Whatever God is placed in your hand, there is something God is looking for. David discovered God made him. David discovered that the kingdom belongs to God. The kingdom belongs to God. Third thing in my close, David discovered that the Lord wanted to use David as a channel to be a blessing to God's people. I want to read that. I want to read that. Put verse 12 up. Put verse 12 up. I want to read that. I want to read that in my heart right now. I just thought about that 12B. And it says, And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom. Look at this part. For his people Israel's sake. I want to tell some people how I know you're going to be blessed is because there's some other people that God wants to be blessed through you. Matter of fact, if you really want everything God wants for you, take you out the equation. And remember Solomon went to God and, Lord, what, what I want, God, I want you to give me wisdom to judge your people. See, this is what the world keeps missing. Whatever you make happen for somebody else, God will make happen for you. God did not set David up simply for David. God set David up for the people of Israel because God knew that David would look out for their behalf. Can I ask you a question? Who is it you are working for? Whose hands are you in? Are you in the hands of God? And the second question, who is in your hand? Who is it you're opening doors for? You're making a way for. If I knew then, but I know now. All those years I was running around acting silly. All those years I was wasting money, wasting effort, blowing my character. If I knew then, what I know now. All those years I was fighting with folk about nothingness. All those years I was running around trying to prove that I'm not this or I am that. If I knew then what I know now, whatever God has for me, whatever God has for you, you don't have to defend it. You don't have to debate it. You don't even have to discuss it. Just stand still. See God's salvation. I'm ministering to you out there now. Those of you that are wrestling with purpose, those of you that are wrestling with doing what God has called you to do, skip, skip some steps. Skip some circumlocutions. 
circumvent some problems and just know today that God is depending upon you to discover your inner self and to become what he has anointed for you are the answer to many. And there is much resource that God is going to place in your hand when you discover who you are. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. I pray that you've been blessed today. Lord knows I know that God is loving on you. God is wanting great things out of your life. I want to ask you today if you desire your prayer, if you desire to talk with someone and to pray with you, intercede on your behalf, we have leaders standing by in our prayer rooms right now that are ready to open their arms wide and pray with you. Information should be strolling across the stream just about now. You, yeah, there it is. See it down there? That is the information you need. People are standing by to pray with you. Go ahead, dial that number. Put that password in. Enter into our prayer rooms. Able body, anointed elders and leaders, people that I've laid hands on myself, that have been prayed up and ready to assist you in discovering God's will for your life. We're waiting on you, man. We would love to have you come in our prayer room. You may be out there and you want to be a part of what God is doing through Pastor Mike and Revelation Church. Simple process. All you need dial is 289-50. Dial 289-50 and text the word Revelation Connect. Revelation Connect. 289-50. Put in Revelation Connect. And we want to connect with you. We want to touch with you. We're getting partners all over the country, man. We're touching lives and our souls all over the world. I'm so ecstatic about it. I'm so blessed of God, and I really appreciate it. Revelation Connect, 289-50. Now I want to challenge everybody. If you know that God has been good to you, you want to share your seed with us today, you want to present the tithe and the offering, then we say right now, simply go to www.rcmcentral.com. You can touch that PayPal button and bam, it's already done. Or you can dial 951-228-5151. 951-228-5151. You can text to give in the amount. I love that cash out. I love that cash out. My wife and I were laying in bed early this morning. Today is Saturday. This is a true story. And 5, 6 o'clock this morning, we heard my phone go I rolled over in my sleep and said, thank you for your faith seed. This is a true story. Thank you for your faith seed. And I want to thank a sister, Erica Roan. I remember the name. Earlier this morning, God placed me in her heart and she sold the seed. Isn't that amazing? You can send your gifts to dollar sign RCM Central 1925. And we'll be happy to receive it in the gift you want to share. I want to thank God for the men of God that are gathered right now outside our building in Courtyard A. There are a, a, a host of men out there right now that have been praying and interceding and praising and worshiping God on your behalf. We're always happy to have you. You're always free to join us. Every Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m., the men of Revelation Church and surrounding areas we meet right here in our courtyard. It's a big area. We mask. We wear masks. We're in big circles. And we're talking about the goodness of Jesus. We're talking about his perfect will for our lives. We would love to have you. Man, I love you all. Thank God for you. I pray you've been blessed. I'm Mike McClure, and I approve this message. Peace.